Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all illustrated for all the major publishers. Uh, We've together published somewhere around 75 books, and we've all taught illustration at the university level. That's right. Each week we come at you guys with listener questions and fascinating topics in illustration. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. All right, here we are. I I should let our listeners know that though our um, podcasting um, drop dropping like what do you say your pod, our podcasting schedule when we drop podcasts <laughs> drop hasn't schedule. been affected at all. However. We have been on vacation from recording podcasts for two months now. <laughs> so least, uh, this yeah. is our first time meeting back together since May, I think. No, Did we yeah, record of, one in June? 2019 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we just recorded a bunch of episodes so we could take the summer off. And that's how I think you run a sustainable uh podcasts that you, you don't get burned out on it right right know. yeah seems like Have seems to. like the right thing to do <laughs> well, and we're still like we said in the intro we're still working illustrators so we you know we do we have projects yeah. and stuff at some point you got to do some work yeah. you know exactly. work in here Stay work incredible. Exactly. so <laughs> let's just quick rundown what'd you guys do this summer and then we'll get into today's topic go ahead lee I uh, did a bunch of illustrations, um, did some painting projects after my Kickstarter finally wrapped up and I got that sent to the printer. It was a huge kind of detox after that. I just wanted to paint with no concept at all. So I started this um, hot air balloon blimp series of paintings. It's been super fun, kind of just a fine art thing. I entered some more uh, art fairs for next year and gallery. All that stuff is starting to come back, thank God, finally from COVID. Uh, And so there is people meeting in you know, and galleries and, and parks and public places again. So it's a good thing. So I had to get all that stuff going and then, uh, and then just truly tried to enjoy a little bit of time here at my new place. I'm in Colorado. And so, uh, you know, traveling to the mountains and mountain bike riding and doing all kinds of stuff. So it's been, uh, it's been fun. I don't want to say it's relaxing cause it hasn't been. It's just like, uh, there's always a little bit of anxiety. I don't know if you guys feel this anytime I stop working, I get anxious for some reason. Instead of just like being totally chill and off work, I feel anxious. Like I should be doing some new work. It's weird. And then I start doing work. I'm like, oh, I need to take time off. And I can never fully give in to both of them. So so it's been it's been as fun as it can yeah. be. <laughs> confessions of a workaholic. I'm the, well, I'm the, the confessions way. of a self-employed person. Uh, because for years <laughs> I didn't even take vacations because I was like, what if I use that money and then I don't get hired, right? right. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> We've all been there. I'm the same way. It's like I am too tired to work, but I am too stressed out to like relax. So I won't relax and I won't work and I'll just get more stressed out. <laughs> Perfect. I remember a veteran illustrator once said, because I had always had these feelings but never vocalized them, that, um, you know, as soon as I, you know, I'd have wor- a lot of illustration work, freelance work coming in always juggling jobs. And then every now and then it would all go, you know, I'd finish my last project and I'd have nothing. And he vocalized, you know, the panic of when that happens and you have nothing and you're like, okay, so that was a good run. I was an illustrator and now I'm not. (laughs) And then, and then a week later, you know, you get another job or two weeks later or something, they start rolling in again and then you're busy and you're like, I should have enjoyed those that week or two. Right. But you can't. And it's tough. Yeah. And it is that is a dilemma that um, you know freelancers of all walks of life, all self-employed service industry people, kind of suffer through. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that's true. What'd you do, um, Will? We went to Hawaii, and I bought these boca shells. I'm rocking right now. Nice. So if you're on YouTube, you can. He's looking very Panama City Beach right now. <laughs> it's got an airbrush t-shirt saying Will Spring Break of 88. We found a, a really a f- super, super affordable Airbnb. Ironically, because uh, Honolulu, or not Honolulu, um, Oahu, the, the government on Oahu 
um, made Airbnbs illegal on the North Shore mm -hmm. unless you unless they rent for three months. So a lot of people are doing them under the table and having to charge a lot less to get people in there. So we got a smoking deal. And um, yes, yeah, so we did that for a month. And then we went to Utah and went camping with our kids. And uh, that, that was pretty much it. I started swimming. So now Beautiful. I'm swimming laps. Yeah. Good. Good. Best exercise there is on the planet. So me, I, in, um, from May 8th to June 8th, I ran a Kickstarter for the Spaceships book. Um, and this was, uh, this was sort of like a, a switch in gears, sort of last minute. No, it's, a, it's a book I'd been wanting to do for a while, but it was like this last minute idea of maybe I have it be more of a, and less, less of a sketchbook, but more of like a, a world building book all about how spaceships fit into this larger universe of comics that I've been doing. Um, so I launched that Kickstarter, ran it until June 8th. And then from June 8th until the end of July, I worked on making the book. And then I took a short four day trip to New York to meet up with my family. And then we came home and I've been back at it, working on this book and doing freelance work. So my summer vacation was four days. <laughs> wow. Uh, and nice. that, that is, I get, you know, I can't complain because I think the last 10 years, my summer vacation has been like five weeks of like really low level working and not like, like just hanging, hanging out most of the time, vacationing or doing whatever. And like just touching base with stuff which has been absolutely wonderful and, and loving it. And I think this summer it was a time to pay the piper type of summer where it's like, you know what, you're a little behind on things. You got to pay off some stuff. It's, it's time to really get some work done. So that's where I was at. Been there. Yep. Yep. So, okay. <laughs> Should we get down into our, I like how like Lee has zero comment. Uh, I want to get started on this topic. I, it's a good one. <laughs> he's like the he's like the horse that's in the shoot, you know, at the, at the rodeo. I know he's just like no, that's like is, bucking is... and like trying to get over the fence before they pull the gate open. No, here's my here's my new take. You guys can see if it how long it lasts. I I'm a natural, very social person, and I love to talk with with people, mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to listen a little more instead mm -hmm. of thinking about what I'm going to say and jump in. So I'm thoughtfully pausing. I'm calling BS on that, this one instance, because I saw you typing while I was explaining what was happening during my summer vacation. <laughs> I wasn't I typing. I was, I, was, I, was, I was drawing. Oh, you're drawing. Okay. <laughs> That's by just, the way, by doesn't the way I'm, count. <laughs> I'm the one that told Lee he needs to listen more. So he that's did. why he's taking my advice. I'm taking Will's advice. Um, I'm gonna be, I like I'm how, just, hey, let's, uh, let's, okay, let's hit record and let's do a podcast. And Lee's like, uh -huh. I'm all about listening now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say anything until the closing yeah. credits. <laughs> and then I'll say either I agree or disagree. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, let's get down into it. We got a question from Jennifer and she is just, she is just doing um, like she's asking the question that's already on everybody's mind. And this has been something that the three of us have been going back and forth on and talking about for the last month. And we keep saying we should record a podcast. We should record a podcast. And it, I'll just say this, it's hard getting back to work when you've been not <laughs> recording a podcast for two months. So, uh, so this is maybe a little belated, but I feel like this AI conversation is going to be with us for, the foreseeable future, you know? Um, but let's just get right down into to, to her question. Subject matter, AI art, copyrights, and the future of illustration as a profession. Um, she has some nice words to say at the beginning that essentially says, you guys are doing a great job, and, and um, thank you so much for what you do through the podcast, through SVS Learn. So we really appreciate that. We won't bore everybody with, with you know, our accolades there. But she says, now to my question... I've seen a lot of conversation recently, especially on Twitter, around AI art and how it might become an issue in the art community because it's getting better and better at imitating human-made illustrations. 
There's the specific AI that's able to emulate an artist's style really well to the point of looking realistically made by said artist and has even imitated the artist's signature, which is insane. People seem to worry about a few things. Among them, we have number one, copyrights. Should the AI developer pay the artist since it's using their style? Sometimes to the point of showing their work in the AI catalog as a style option. Where can we draw the line in plagiarism when it comes to a machine that is directly taking from your work, even though they're not copying one specific image, but your entire portfolio? So that's the one side. Copyright, who owns the rights to this work? Number two, is a art a threat for artists that work commercially? Some people compare it with websites like Fiverr and Stock Illustration and believe AI art would never replace a human-made illustration. Others are comparing it with when photography killed painting and believe AI art will steal illustrators' jobs. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I loved your inputs on NFTs. Thank you. All right, guys. So I think we just, we might have a few people listening to us who just need to get up to speed on what AI art actually is and uh and here's my understanding of it there's actually a great video that that explains it really well on youtube and i want you to search search it for it. it's by vox and it's called what was it i sent it to you guys it's the ai that creates any picture you want explained so it's a 13 minute video mm-hmm. and uh and and that'll really get you up to speed on what it is but essentially i'll tell you what ai art what the AI isn't doing, what it's not doing is, um, well, even before that, this is what it does. You type in a prompt and the AI generates a picture of what you typed in. So you could type in um, uh, uh, a snowman using a flamethrower burning a uh, candy cane, right? Um, And the AI will chug along for a minute or so and then spit out a picture of either painted or photographed, depending on the different AI machine that you're doing, that looks like a uh, a, a actual snowman with a flamethrower um, burning up a candy cane. It's that specific, and and uh, and it's 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 actually scary in some, in some ways. Okay, so how does it do it? What it doesn't do is go f- search Google for a picture of a candy cane. Uh, search Google for a picture of a flamethrower and a picture of a um, a snowman and then collage them together. That's not what's happening here. Mm-hmm. What it actually does is it's it's much more granular and atomic than than what that is. What the AI has done is they feed into it. There's like five different phases of what it's doing. They feed into it hundreds of millions of images with descriptions attached to them okay google has already done a lot of the work here um, when you type into google give me an image of a um, of a snowman um, the algorithm has already figured out here's a thousand pictures of snowmen right from stock footage or, or stock imagery of 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 snowman to like instagram photos that people have taken of snowman so now you have this data set of what this full spectrum of what an image of a snowman could be. Okay, so this AI just downloads all of that, the 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 data of what the pixels, the RGB individual inputs on the pixels of what makes up a snowman, along with the worded description of what a snowman is. And then what it does is it goes into this, the AI part of it, which is deep learning. Uh, it has this raw data. Now it's learning... Um, how to parse between like here's pictures of bananas here's pictures of snowmen here's pictures of uh snow globes here's pictures of candy canes here's pictures of flamethrowers right and it's figuring out uh exactly its understanding of the different pixels that that make that up but not just that it's figuring out this is the difference between a photo and this is the difference between a painting this is the difference between a 3D render and this is the difference between like anime, right? So it's it's like very much going into not just the, the subject matter, but this is the difference between something shiny and this is the difference between something, you know, dull, right? So textures, shapes, colors, all these things. So then it goes into the next stage and that's called the latent space. 
is what they're calling it. Latent space is where it creates a, a, a multi-dimensional understanding of all this data. So in the in the video that I talked about, it says, you know, a banana is yellow and a balloon is red, right? A red balloon, party balloon. What happens when you have an image that has uh, a yellow balloon and perhaps a banana that's that's cut in half, right? So now we still have a banana, but it's not shaped like what we think of banana is. And we have a balloon, but now it's different. We realize balloons can be any different color. So what it's doing is it's making a multi-dimensional map of all these things that it's already learned about: shape, texture, um, uh, you know, composition, uh, photography versus painting, all this stuff, and it's and it's essentially mapping out all these different um, uh, uh, connections between these things. And then it goes into the next phase, which is generation. So once it gets the prompt, it can start figuring out, okay, here's all the zeros and ones that we need to put together to apply to this prompt. And then it goes into output mode. And what happens when you, you know, that's when you start seeing the image. What happens when you use something like we've all or me and lee i know have used mid journey to like render images what happens is you'll type it in and you'll see the percentage of it done and that first image that it spits out is like blurry you know just a blurry really out of focus image and essentially that's like um it's sort of this randomly generated um uh, like noise filter of something and then it starts plugging in like Okay, we're going to put in our snowman here. Okay, we're going to put in a flamethrower here. And and as it starts figuring out, like, you know, this feels more like what I think it should be, it starts adding detail. And it just gets better and better resolution until it's 100% done. And then you've got something that's pretty close. Um, so that is essentially how it works. It's not, I'll just repeat, it's not like grabbing and pulling and collaging, it's actually building something brand new from the ground up that has never existed before, though it looks familiar. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Is that that pretty close to how you guys understand it? Mm -hmm. That was way more than I actually understood. <laughs> uh, it's just like, you press the button, it, it's, it, it crawls the web, finds a bunch of stuff, you know, <laughs> puts together. Sometimes a, a shockingly amazing you know, interpretation of the things you entered. Sometimes a hilarious interpretation. Like we, we were, me and Jake were trying to mess with it uh, a little bit. And so I was like, all right, let's see what it would put in. We were just testing out prompts and I entered um, a kid playing with a dinosaur. I'll post these, uh, by the way, if you guys want to see some of the stuff we're talking about, I'll post these uh, images uh, on the, in the story notes. And then also if you're watching it on YouTube, maybe I'll share, if I can find it, I'll, I'll share it. Um, but it's, it was, it was hilarious. It's the, when it tried to combine the kid and the dinosaur, it laying together, it literally combined it to where the dinosaur had like kid legs. Do you remember that Jake? It's yeah, just yeah. so bizarre. <laughs> and I was like, okay, my job's safe for a little while. <laughs> right. you know, <laughs> oh, no. Hey, by the way, I just, just then I, um, while you were talking, I went ahead and entered a snowman with a flamethrower. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send it to you guys and we can pull it up on our screen if you want to, Jake. Yeah. Um, Do you want to share your it. screen? Yeah, just it. share it. I'll just give it to you. You got, you have the uh, thing. So I just shared it with you. You can share it, share your screen if you want to. Oh, nice. Okay. Let me, uh, so this is, this is in mid journey and I, I just entered that exact prompt. The prompt was snowman with a flamethrower. That's all I, that's all. So, I and then anybody that's listening on, you know, a podcast, um, can join us on YouTube to see this on, uh, the SVS learn channel. Yeah. It's uh school of visual storytelling on school YouTube, but yeah. here we got, okay. So this is interesting. Uh, if you're just listening, we've got four images here. They all look like, um, what painted style would you, this is like children's book ish, right? Uh -huh. It's weird. Did Cause you, I didn't enter, I didn't enter any, any style in. I just entered here. I'm going to try it again where I say, uh, snowman with a flamethrower. Um, what do you think? Realistic or something and see what the difference is. Yeah. Okay. Do not do realistic. Do, um, if you, if you actually do something like unreal engine render, or something okay. like that. It'll give it. It'll give it a different look. But yeah, these almost look like the proportions here are 
almost like a Mary Englebright type of uh, style that we could get here. This top left corner illustration of uh-huh. the, I would not know that that's a snowman. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's just the body. It's, got, so it's sort of like a Halloween version of a snowman. Yeah, it's got like uh-huh. a pumpkin head um, and it's melting from the inside out. Um, but it does have a cool little top hat. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, but then these bottom ones, like, yeah, we're getting, getting pretty we're getting good. summer. We're getting somewhere. There's a little sci-fi flavor to it as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and add, we haven't really started talking opinions on it, but I'm going to go ahead and use this as a springboard because what happened there is exactly, the, there's there's so many downsides to this technology, I realize, and we're, I'm sure we're going to get into it. But the upside is that one, I don't care about the three snowmen that look like snow, snowman, is that plural for a couple yeah. of snowmen? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Snowmans. Um, <laughs> snowman. <laughs> but the one weird one is the one that I like because all of a sudden it changes how you think about something. Right. And that is where ultimately I land on this technology is I'm not looking for it to give me the answer. I'm looking, I'm looking at almost to give me the starting point to the question, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, I th- this is interesting <laughs> because... Uh, about a month ago, I, I was like, Lee, do you know what's going on with AI art mid journey? This is when Will was MIA somewhere. We couldn't even reach him by cell phone. He was in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> and, and Lee's like, what, what are you talking about? I said, okay, go get an account and go on mid journey and, and type, you know, type something in. And you should have seen the look on his face. He was like the, the, the sentence before that, the conversation before that was like, I'm so tired of like. I have to like come up with illustrations. I have to finish this thing. I was, I was burned like, well, out for sure. It's just burned out. I was like, well, you could have, uh, you know, just AI do your job. And he's like, what? And so we went through it and he typed in the prompt for the next illustration he had to make. And it started giving him all these ideas. He's like, I'm going to be done with this job in like a month. <laughs> <laughs> he got so but excited. The important thing though, is it didn't, it, like I said, it didn't give the full finish. Like it's going to require an artist mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. really see where the potential is. And I mean, I've used prompts. I'm going to say prompts. So there's um, the new one. Yeah. In the past. Yeah. Yeah. So, one. yeah. So that's the one that's like realistic, uh, with the unreal engine prompt in there. Well, you know, it's definitely a different look. And so it's kind of cool that you can do that. But, um, but I used to, I had a whole, a whole assignment that I used to give as a teacher and then something I did as a student as well, where I would walk around and I'd photograph spots, stains, uh, uh, bark, things like that, that just offered kind of a starter shape. Mm -hmm. And then I would be like, Oh, that looks like a forest or that looks like a spaceship. That looks like this or that a bridge or whatever. And, uh, and then I would use that as the basis to start building on. Um, I did the same thing with abstract art for a little while. I would enter in like a Mark Rothko painting or, 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 uh, uh, Rauschenberg was one of them that I used to enter mm-hmm. and I'd, I'd turn it upside down and I'd look for another illustration within those shapes and just use it basically as big starter blocks. And and the beautiful thing about that one is it gave me a starting point of color too, because these, these abstract artists had already you know, painted this image. And so, but when I flipped it upside down and kind of squinted my vision, I got mm-hmm. a whole new take and that would be my starting point. And so just starting from something rather than starting from nothing is a beautiful thing and it can Mm -hmm. you can end up you you can grow so much by doing that it gets you out of your own head i I mean if you look at people's sketchbooks they draw the same freaking thing over and over in just Mm -hmm. barely different ways and then a lot of people you can extrapolate that to their paintings it's sort of the same painting every time Mm -hmm. you jumped yeah you jumped straight into the positive which is yeah yeah i'm for it (laughs) That was sort of what was interesting before we even debated whether this was good or bad or or whatever. Lee was like, I'm using this. I could see exactly where I could fit this into my workflow. And this is going to help me a ton. And so I think that's like, if you're already like an accomplished illustrator and you have a style and you're established, like this is definitely a tool like Photoshop or like Pinterest is a tool in that. Correct. Prior to Pinterest, um, I had just a massive hard drive 
folder, eight gigabytes, 10 gigabytes, 13, whatever, of images I'd pulled from the internet and had just organized in, you know, by artist or by subject and whatnot. And that's what I'd go to for reference. Anytime I'd see something cool, I'd stick it in there. Pinterest came along, ArtStation came along, and and Behance. And now I have like my favorites where I could just go to these different websites and just see things like favorited, right? So I don't organize them on my hard drive anymore. Prior to having a hard drive, I had a clip file, like a, a morgue files is what it used to be called. And what that is, is like series of folders or binders where you find images in magazines, you find images in newspapers, you photocopy stuff from books and, or, or, you know, if you, if you wanted something physical, you'd pull it off from the internet and print it and stick it in these books. And then you'd have all these folders full of reference that you go to. Um, and so your work as an artist is, is always like, you're the digestive force of everything around you, right? You're always intaking and you're always outputting and your art is only good as what you put inside of you, right? And AI seems to be able to do some of that job for you in ways that you wouldn't, like Lee was saying, expect. And so for that, it's it's really interesting. It's really cool. I think the big worry that a lot of people have and 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 even i have sometimes is is it can also be the end point not the middle point but it can be like the final image that someone who is hiring an artist for needs it's true i mean let's go ahead and put out the sort of the worst case scenario that's kind of making the rounds on the news right now where somebody entered a contest, happened to be here in Colorado, actually, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. entered a contest. He, he, he prompted and prompted and prompted until he ended up with three images that he liked. He had them output uh, on canvas and he entered them in an art competition, sort of kind of held, uh, kept it hidden on the creation Mm-hmm. Uh, way it was created, or if he did mention it, the judges had no idea what he's talking he, about. He they, entered it into the digital art category, and they hadn't right. clearly defined what digital art is. And it's not you a misnomer. I mean, that's true. It was. It is mm-hmm. digital art. I mean, and so he won anyway. And so that just sparked he, a and ton he submitted of three, rage. Three paintings, actually, he submitted three of them, and one of yeah. them, one of them won. The other two, I didn't think were quite as interesting as the one that did win, but. But yeah, it's, it's it, interesting though, because that is like you're saying, that's the end point. And, you know, my, my take on that was I immediately texted Jake and Will and I was like, check this out, you know, and, <laughs> and I was talking about that implications in a, in an art fair where the judges aren't up to speed on mm-hmm. what this is. If people start entering that in and the judges think, wow, all of a sudden there's these great new painters that we've never heard of before mm-hmm. and they're printing them on canvas and nobody's, you know, we're none the wiser. They are mm-hmm. going to displace, you know, the whole goal of a, of an art market, especially a local kind of art market is to give a place for painters and people that are professional artists to show their work and sell outside of the gallery system. And all of a sudden these people are going to take those spots. There's only a limited number of places in those shows if they start displacing real artists, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. So now, I, I would say, this, can, can yeah, I go ahead, jump Will. in? It's, I think it's really important to note, and it's probably fairly obvious, but the point of um, the, the finish point in an art contest is a personal statement. And so the, the consumer, you know, looks at, you know, if they're looking to, to purchase a piece of art, they're looking for a piece of art that looks good, that they like, that that resonates with them. Mm-hmm. It's very different from uh, an illustration assignment where the art is dictated by the the assignment. So I, it's easy for me to uh, to believe that uh, AI right now could win an art contest where the the image is not um, constrained. Specific, yeah, right. But but uh, illustration is going to take. A bit longer, and I and I'm not saying that it won't get there either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, you it's know. in the beta. I mean, we should mention that it's just in the beta. It's the starting point. Yeah, and that's what's next that's year. What's sort of terrifying. Next year it'll get, it'll, it'll <laughs> well, win the illustration. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a. a <laughs> I think it's faster than that because I'm already seeing yeah. there's another there's another program called Stable Fusion, which is like next level mid journey, um, and 
not as many people are using it because it's 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 harder to like use, right? Mm-hmm. But you can actually upload your own art or specific images and say we need something that that looks like this or that mm. um like I saw a guy upload a sketch and essentially tell it say okay everything that's um that's sketchy here I need it to have buildings in it and everything over here I need to have like foliage right and then the AI filled it in and said okay we'll put your buildings here and your foliage here and now he had essentially the AI rendering for him what he had sketched out right mm. so so like that right there is already next level you're not just mm-hmm. putting in prompts but you're putting in you know compositional oh, notes and stuff like that and i could see it going to a place where ultimately like you 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 can upload a sketch or you could even like pose you know there could be a um uh like a 3d model of a character and you just put it in the pose that you wanted or drop down menu of poses, or you can like manually put a character in your pose and then say, here's a character I designed. Here's like their front back side view of it. Um, put that skin on this character and place them in this environment. And it's just doing all of that for you precisely. Cause right now, you know, some of the, some of the obvious like glaring problems is, Mid journey can't do hands very well, and there's some wonkiness that happens in the eye area and stuff like that. And so you do have to touch it up, but that that's all just going to get like figured out. Um, and then I think that the point on top of that is what happens when you feed into it instead of images, you feed into it 3D models, right? So now it knows how it has to, all the data. Yeah. yeah, and it knows spatial relationships, and it knows you know you just. You, you could go feed into it like drone scans of buildings and of cities and of architecture and, and, and rocks formations and all that stuff. And you could just say, you know, I need the Statue of Liberty from this angle um, with Spider-Man swinging around like this. And it needs to be rendered in like Todd McFarlane style. And boom, <laughs> you've got a comic book cover, right? So uh, I think... There's going back to the contest thing. I think the simple solution there is you just have a category that's like AI art. And so Mm -hmm. you have essentially, you know, like in the Olympics, you would have um, real humans and then the androids, right? Uh (laughs) Like this this is android competition. This is human competition. Or, you know, it's like. uh, That's interesting. I I like it. I like, I like thinking about ownership of an image. I remember a while back and when I say a while back, this is probably 15 years ago, uh, in the communication arts, uh, photography annual, Mm -hmm. there was this, uh, person who won a a, a series of images for a series of images. And he was actually an art director and he had no experience as a photographer, didn't own all the equipment and all that stuff. And so, but he had relationships with local photographers that he worked with as an art director. And so he said, Hey, here's, here's what I got. He sketches out a thumbnail, uh, uh, mentions some locations, goes with the photographer and then, but the photographer is the one taking the picture. And then the the debate became who own, who is responsible for that artwork. And so this Mm -hmm. is kind of the same thing, right? And there was no answer. They, they they both had credit as, as, as photographers. I mean, that's as old as like um, uh, Michelangelo, right? Like he had a workshop with people all Elves. sculpting and working with him. And he was True. like, essentially, you know, uh, shave a little bit off here, do a little bit like that. And then you even have like Warhol, like he just had. He didn't get his fingers uh, dirty after a while. <laughs> right, yeah. right. He's like, I need 25 Marilyn Monroe's on my desk, by, you know, by noon tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And they're in their silk screening and, and, and working on stuff. So, so there's that. And then what's, what is there, you know, what to say to someone who has a style? I mean, you go to Barnes and Noble today and, and you're going to see a look and it might be like, Classian, John Classen sort of style that's kind of filtered into a bunch of other books, right? There's a lot of texture, there's a lot of geometric shapes. Mm-hmm. And can those artists who are influenced by John Classen really take ownership of their work? I say, yeah. I mean, they, they, they're creating their work themselves. 
they're adding something to that style. They're not, you know, even if they they did something very much in his style, they're not like as long as they're not like one to one replicating, you right. know, a bear that he designed. They're right. um, well, they're almost they're using still, him like they're they're using him as sort of the AI starting point, really. Like, okay, exactly. I'm going to design a world. It's going to look like these these kind of parameters, but mm-hmm. we just did it internally. And we talked mm-hmm. a lot about that. In uh, you know, it's just I'm, I guess the point I'm going to make here is artists are the first ones to get so up in arms about it. Oh my gosh, how dare this! you know, software exists. You don't have to do anything. But then we go to like a, a, a convention like CTN, the animation expo, and we see like Brittany Lee in a booth. And then we see like 45 mini Brittany Lees <laughs> who are just, I mean, almost exactly like her. And who are all doing the- <laughs> Mary Blair, you know, from, Correct. Six, from 40 years ago, Correct. 50 years ago. Right. Correct. Uh, and, yeah. And, and not to throw any shade on Brittany Lee. I think she's definitely, oh, she's amazing. I mean, she was the starting point artist. of that. So she's right. the, she's the prompt. Right. But I, I, I need, also I want to clarify art. too, like if you're going back to my John class and artist mimicry sort of thing, like if that's the, I don't knock any artist who's like, I got to get work as an illustrator. Publishers are hiring people who did do this kind of illustration. I'm going to bend my style towards that so I can get more work. Like that is perfectly a legitimate way for an artist to work, but it does come with the pitfall of when the industry shifts and they want something new and fresh, you know, are you going to be able to, it, can you keep chasing that for your whole career or does mm-hmm. it make sense just to find what you make and let that, you know, sort of become known for being the artist that, that makes the style that you make. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's two ways to go about it. And artists has ha- have had success in both. And there's also pitfalls in both, because if you are the artist that does one style and that style goes out of style, then you're not getting work anymore. So, right. you know, it, I mean, it goes back to what Will was saying about Brad Holland back in the day. You know, there was a bunch of mini Brad Hollands. Did they pivot when mm-hmm. Brad Holland wasn't the flavor of the month anymore? Right. You know, I don't think they did because I've still got yeah. some of those illustration no. annuals and yeah, I don't recognize didn't. any of those names. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, they, so they became obsolete as well. Correct. Coattail riding, just riding into the sunset and gone. Right. Yeah. Let me ask okay. you guys a question real quick. Um, yeah. This is a debate that I was seeing on Facebook this morning and I was participating in this little um, conversation. If somebody's not an artist already and now they've got access to this and they type it in and they get the, you know, the results like that guy did who won the little, the contest, is he an artist? Is it okay for him to say he's an artist? Is he not no. an artist? How do we define that? Do we need to define that? I really believe that what your value is to a client is your experiences that you've had mm-hmm. in life. Mm-hmm. That's really what it comes down to is, is the way that you synthesize your experiences and um, take, take the, the assignment that you're given and you know, you're going to bring something totally unique and fresh. And, um, and so I would, I would tend to think that someone who, um, Maybe maybe somebody older, maybe maybe the maybe the AI would really help someone older coming in to being an artist who's lived and who's experienced a lot. Um, maybe it would help them fast track them into into becoming an artist. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it, yeah, here's ahead. my here's sort of my take on that. Not everyone not everyone who's creative can make art, and not everyone who can make art is creative. Right. So I see really good technical artists who can do like, you know, a a 13 by 15 charcoal image of an eye and it's just Mm -hmm. rendered out beautifully. And that's super cool. But you can get pretty much the same effect by um, a large format printer (laughs) doing the same same sort of thing. Right. they're not a, a, something like that doesn't quite move me like an uh you know an illustration that's really saying something or a piece of art that's really that's really saying and, something right and then yeah and then you get into which is something that I've been preaching in my um my uh, creativity class that I just released this year on uh, 
svslearn.com. And that is that there's a lot of assignments and a lot of texts that we're given mm-hmm. um, where the illustration should not match the text exactly where, where um, to, to make the illustration more exciting and more um, interesting, mm-hmm. you tell another story within the text that you're given. And the example mm-hmm. I use is, um, and I'll have to describe it visually, but it's um, in, in the book that I did, Bonaparte Falls Apart, where, you know, it's just the story of this little skeleton. And his, his problem is that, it, you know, whenever he's doing activities, his bones fall apart, right? Right. And so sometimes his arm will fall off, sometimes his foot will fall off, sometimes his head will roll away. And so uh, the text was, and I'm going to not get it precisely, but um, his, his, um, sometimes his bones rolled away and he had a hard time finding them. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I struggled with that. I'm like, well, what bone is going to fall and roll away? All right. Mm-hmm. So I, I looked at a leg bone, but if it's attached to a foot, it's not going to roll very far. Cause the foot's going to, you know, hang it up. Right. Same with an arm. It could be the pelvis. Cause it's kind of round mm-hmm. I played with that, but he he can't hold together without a pelvis mm-hmm. and so it's like a linchpin bone. yeah <laughs> yeah so quickly it became the head but not just making the head roll away that's that's the linear way to solve it right mm-hmm. um the more creative way to solve it was i had his head roll away and it was under the bed but his head could still see his body but his body couldn't see his head mm-hmm. this is not mm-hmm. in the text at all right 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 right, right. and I put a basketball in there that his hand is just about to touch. So mm-hmm. he's about to find his head and his body's going to think, Oh good. I found it. Mm-hmm. And the viewer has to fill in. Well, when he puts the the basketball on top right. of his neck, it's not, he's, it's not going to be right. right. Okay. See. The, the, okay. Now, what do you guys think of that with, with in reference to AI? Yeah. Well, what I you're describing that- is something that AI is not capable of doing yet. <laughs> Well, that's going to be, that's going to be the difference. And that was the point I made on that Facebook thread. I said that, that this technology, if somebody comes to it with no experience, they're going to be able to make better art than they could have otherwise done. Right. I mean, that's a given, Mm -hmm. but where it's going to excel is in the true, in the artist's hands, the artists are going to be the one who makes ones who make great art. Now, maybe they make the scene using AI and then they fill in what you're saying here, which is very, very specific. And I don't see the AI doing that quite yet, you know, doing it well. Right. But, you know, gets you halfway there, gives me a color palette, gives me sort of a setting for the room. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden I add those narrative bits on top and all of a sudden it's a kind of a win-win. Um, yeah. I just, te- I just texted you guys a, uh, a, just a, it's just a straight up drawing by Scott Robertson, but he's using some AI, um, uh, by let's see, it's called, if you go to app.wombo.art, it allows mm-hmm. you to enter your own art in there. And then it has a bunch of different kind of uh, settings like gouache, realistic, comic book, uh, oh, even Studio Ghibli. But you're starting with your own base um, and he's messing with it. And granted, there's no narrative to his stuff. He's like kind of does, uh, you know, he's a concept spaceships. Artist. He's a concept yeah. artist, does a lot, lot of vehicles. I mean, he's the guy to go to for that kind of stuff. Um, but what it made was something far more interesting yeah. than I think any of his other art is in terms you of just see art. that on someone um, blowing that up and putting it on a wall. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Our, I mean, it's and like, so, yeah, but yeah. it's him. I mean, it's, and so it's kind of the example that I'm leaning towards where this thing excels is when it's a combination of the artist and the technology getting you somewhere. Maybe you wouldn't have gone mm-hmm. elsewhere. I mean, it's right. the same thing also as music using that. Remember when, when digital music came out and auto tune and all that, even, even, uh, just like stock, uh, music and, 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 um, DJ kind of things where you're looping stuff together and you're creating stuff, a mismatch of stuff. It didn't kill music. It didn't do right. anything to music except for make it better and make it more diverse. Right. I think I wanna... that, let me just insert this really quick that, uh, you know, Photoshop made my life better in that it, it literally allows me to make images twice as fast. Right. Mm-hmm. And I see this AI really making, uh, cutting that time again probably Mm -hmm. i can imagine if i if i learn to use it cutting my time into a fourth or even less Mm -hmm. Uh, so so and the benefit there is then you have time to um, 
start another business, mm-hmm. have right. more free, more time with your family. I think mm-hmm. it makes your life better in many ways. And I think that it's the tendency is to just to just look at the negatives and to to to, right. to go to fear. Um, I want to so. I want to go back just to just to go back to what I was. I, I didn't think I fully expressed my thought, but the the artist who does the mural size painting of an eye, right? That you could absolutely just print out on a large format print printer and and have sort of the same thing. I think the value there isn't so much in the the image that they're creating, but the way that they're creating it. So when I see like these Instagram artists or these TikTok people and they're like, you know, spending hours stippling <coughs> a really photographic, photorealistic image, like the impressive thing there isn't that I chose this to make a portrait of this person. It's that they spent 40 hours working on, you know, uh, working on this thing and that's what they devoted their time to right and so ai can't replace that like that human element that a person chose to spend their time doing that and look at all the craft and artistry that went into making that right it's just way more impressive and and you, honestly you know if you're a, an art buyer you're and you have the money you're going to want an original handmade thing versus a print right, right? and i think moving forward um, if you have the budget and you have the money, whether you're a producer working on a film or a uh, uh, you know or an art collector or a, a, an editor who wants an illustrated book, you're going to want the thing made by a human because there's a there's a uh, artisanal factor there that you're not getting from AI. Now, if you're in the business of listen, I just need to crank something out. I need ideas fast. Um, I was only hiring artists in the first place for idea generation. Now AI kind of fills that, fills that void for them, you know, could fill that, that, that thing for them. So in a sense, yes, it's stealing art or stealing jobs from certain artists, but it's also in a way making art made by humans more valuable. Mm. Um, That's true. Because it's, it's, it's rarer and it's more, you know, it's more unique. So if you're creating art that can easily be replicated, like can easily be taken over by AR, your sort of focus now as an artist is how do I make art that has value or, or how do I find the, the people who value this kind of art that I'm making? That's sort of like your job now as an artist. And you guys, like you specifically, Will, you've lived through an industry like upheaval, like a, mm-hmm. a, a flip in the industry. How did you weather that? And what was it? Yeah, like when, like when they invented the camera. What would that feel like, Will? <laughs> yeah. You, you were doing like... I see what you did there. Um, we had this talk earlier that... Uh, because I'm, I'm the more seasoned veteran here that I have a lot more wisdom. So they like to, they like to poke fun. No, right. um, yeah, like um, the stock. Are you talking about stock illustration? Stock illustration and just editorial illustration, kind and, of and like Photoshop, we, kind of all collided just, at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like there I were mean, you. For, you left art school with able to do three hundred thousand a year in illustration work, and not that much. Five hundred thousand. Going okay. the wrong way. No, six, I did. I did really well. Six I did six figures doing... in editorial work, and mm-hmm. I realized um, what what happened was um, one year. It was like two years um, uh, as an illustrator, and then the first catalog for SIS, which was Stock Illustration Source, came out. And prior to that, it was photographers going oh they're taking over our career and i'm like and and when i was in school i'm thinking this is why i want to go into illustration and not photography is because um you know this the stock illustration is a thing and it's it's decimating careers out there and mm-hmm. forcing photographers that were doing you know generic work to do more specific mm-hmm. work but then when it came into illustration i saw the writing on the wall i was doing anonymous figures which is what business clients wanted which mm-hmm. is what uh business magazines wanted so mm-hmm. the more the brad holland look and you guys can can google brad holland little people 
paintings, um, guys in business suits or white ties and women in business suits and uh, doing a concept. So it was like little people with, with big objects was like the, the thing back then. And, you know, and then all the, all the illustrators that were doing those were taking those images that they had done for magazines and sending them to the stock catalog. And I'm like, so these images are never going away. These concepts mm -hmm. are going to build over time and the catalog is going to get bigger in the next year. So it was, it was about uh, the first year was like an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. The second year was an inch <laughs> of images and it, mm -hmm. and it grew from there, you know, and then there were other <laughs> companies getting into it. And, and uh, so I switched over to children's books because I, my theory was instead of doing a one-off image that is of one concept, mm -hmm. if I do a narrative where I have to hold a character throughout a book, you can't do that. You can't sell that in stock and stock never did compete in the publishing, the narrative publishing world. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, I warned, I, it's a long story, but I, you know, I told a lot of other illustrators, the children's book uh, market is going to get really competitive as the rats flee the ship of the sinking <laughs> ship of uh, editorial and editorial got decimated. I mean, it was, you know, it's today, it's probably 5%, if that, of what it used to be. Mm -hmm. and that, there's a lot of careers that had to change and a lot of artists, a lot of illustrators at that time that I have a friend that became a banker, you know, they just went and got a, a job at a bank. Mm -hmm. Another one, another friend who was really heavy into illustration or into the editorial world um, opened a gallery. Um, mm -hmm. And but th they were forced to make these right turns in their careers, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's um, always going to happen, though. I mean, it doesn't doesn't yeah. matter whether it's AI or or some other thing that comes in. There's always going to be a shift, yeah. and you're always going to have to pivot. I mean, I always use the analogy in my classes. At some point, somebody was making the last of the horse and buggy carriages. Yeah, and they probably were great. They were probably the best well, company and out if there you making. Look, it, but the propaganda at the time was, don't buy an automobile. Right. Don't do it. And there will be people that the artists that say, don't don't succumb. Don't use the tool. Don't use the AI tool. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you're not going to stop it. That's one thing. I, know. I had a I had a, um, a professor at um, the school I went to at BYU who said uh, that the one year he uh, I can't remember. It would have been 19. I'm going to date myself. Probably 89. And he said, uh, the computer will, he was a graphic design teacher. The computer will never be used to spec art, to spec, um, it'll never be used to create uh, graphic design. He <laughs> got, gosh. he got laid off the next year. And they had the, the, the Mac was, well, the, well, a couple, <laughs> a couple students had Macs and they were like, Hey, so we can do our assignment on the computer. He wouldn't let them. Yeah. Wow, you know, and he just so what he a just, narrow sided yeah. like. Teacher. I give his name. He was a, he was a jerk, but I I don't want to be a jerk as well. But uh, no, he was he was a jerk to a lot of people, and you know, um, yeah. And so, uh, but I, yeah, I first saw AI images like posted on ArtStation, uh, like in January, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Oh, this is kind of cool, like. This is some weird stuff that they're making that's like like pretty neat. You know, I didn't know how they were doing it or what they were using because back then it was like the these, you know, it wasn't open beta. It was like we're handpicking different artists to kind of help us build this, mm. you know, this system. And so let's see what they can do with it. Um, about June, I want to say, is when it really like for mid journey. Um, it became open like you could you could sign up and within a few days get a, a, a an account to like make the art and that's when I started seeing a lot of this discussion on Twitter like oh my gosh you know this is the end this is the end of it <laughs> right and then a couple weeks later someone posts this uh, uh, Atlantic article that the illustration for the article the editorial illustration was done in mid journey you know, made by yeah. prompts from mid journey. And then everybody online was saying, Oh, well now it's the end. Right. And then <laughs> I, I saw someone tweet like, all right, my students are turning in artwork for their assignments. That's 
clearly made in uh you know by ai Uh and still people are like okay now it's the end and then the new york times article about this colorado guy who wins the art contest now it's the end all this has happened within the span of like a couple (laughs) a couple months and i think what i think just going down this thread um is is this landscape is changing but also in this time span of the la- these last few months, I'm still being called upon for my art abilities to design specific things by companies that have just as much access to artists who could do AI, artists or, or them, art directors who could do AI themselves, but still they're wanting some sort of human element to the things that I'm creating, as well as my Spaceship's Kickstarter book launched in the middle of all this AI like panic and that book made over $80,000 on Kickstarter. Right. So it's, it's like you, you can be worried and you should definitely pay attention to what's happening here, but it's not going to go away. You can't wish it away. You can't just turn this off and say, you know, you know, boycott AI or whatever. It's, it's just going to be a a component of life now. And you as an artist need to figure out what can I make that Mm -hmm. has this human element that you can't get from AI. You know, if I came out with a spaceship book that was all AI generated, like all these, you know, 100 spaceships all generated by AI, you know, my, my unique prompts and here's what I designed. Is that something someone's really going to want versus, you know, some of the, 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 the stuff that I created for my own imagination or, you know, would I be more successful if I used AI as a tool and helped me generate ideas that then I then filtered through my own style right. and my ability. So, so I think there's a lot of options here. Um, Lee, you posted a few more of these things. Yeah, on. you want if you want to share this because it, this is just a this will be our little uh, um, fun little interlude. If you want to post or, or so Jake's sharing his screen right now. So I I sat down with my son just messing around. He's he's 11, getting ready to be 12, and mm-hmm. I was like I was like son, this thing will make images of whatever we say instantly. And I was like, I, let's play. And so, mm-hmm. you know, just use instead of being so scared of it, just like using it again, just as a play tool, see what he, see what an 11 year old will come up with. So this prompt that we're looking at here was uh, a spider cake. Those are the two <laughs> words that he put together. And then, and then we did a high res render of that one on the lower left, which is shockingly awesome. Wow. And Un- creepy. <laughs> belie- it's so creepy and so awesome at the same time. And we just were having a blast with it. Um, what flavor is that? <laughs> I don't, know. I don't like want to know. <laughs> vanilla frosting on this nasty spider it's base with these huge eyes. <laughs> 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 but we were just having, we were having such a good time with it. The next prompt we, he entered was, and this shows the limitation of it in it's uh, the pure limitation of the, of the software. The prompt for this one, get this is a chihuahua riding a monkey. <laughs> and so if you guys see this, it is the most surreal, riding, terrifying, put riding, a monkey. riding a monkey. Yeah. A chihuahua riding a monkey and it combined it the monkey. <laughs> Combine them, the Chihuahua monkey, and I don't know what else. It almost looks and like an octopus. On it. That one, <laughs> it, one yeah, of them that, has a helmet. That so one makes bizarre. you feel like you have job security for a little bit longer. <laughs> mm-hmm, right. This was kind of the result that I got when, I, like I was saying, when when Jake and I entered a kid playing with a, a dinosaur, it's just so so far off of what you're trying to get to. That mm. I don't know if I don't know how. It, like if I needed a Chihuahua riding a monkey, and I'm an and now I'm, I'm, I'm an AI artist and my, that's what my client is asking for. What prompt do I enter besides Chihuahua riding a monkey that gives me a Chihuahua riding a monkey? Right. If that's the, if this weird morphed, crazy, like mm-hmm. nightmare surrealist version is what it's given me. I don't know. I don't know how else to, maybe, maybe that's what people will learn is how to sort of manipulate the prompt to nudge it in the right direction. I don't know how to do it because that's what I got when I entered that. So, well, it'll solve that. I mean, Mm -hmm. definitely. And there's probably other, other, um, software programs that would nail it, but let let me, let me offer a, a, an observation and what I think is a really bright spot in this discussion. And that is, I think, um, illustrators or creatives in general, creative people um, 
limit themselves by thinking that their creativity only applies to their art. Mm-hmm. And what I what I mean by that is I I let me give you an example. I'm working with a guy right now on a on a book project, mm-hmm. um, and he he and his family are own a game company, and they're very successful. They sell thousands and thousands of their board games and uh, have have done really really well. And one of the things that he did was he took his skill in game creation. And he was at uh, Crumble Cookies mm-hmm. one day, and he was like, I think there's a game, there's a cookie game that could be done with, with Crumble Cookies. And, mm. um, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach the, the owner and, uh, and, and that, that team and, and, and try to figure out if there's a collaboration. It's launching. You know, he's launching that. And so I think that what artists do is we focus on like the creativity of the craft and of, of what we're Mm -hmm. making, but we forget about being creative in the marketplace. And that's really where you you see like so many artists thriving and making Mm -hmm. really good money, but they're not waiting to be picked. They're picking themselves as, and I'm stealing that from Seth Godin's linchpin book. They're picking themselves and saying, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to make this thing and I'm going to give it to the world. Right. I'm going to take right. it to market. And there's creative ways of doing that. You can take it to market on your own through, through crowdfunding. Like, you know, Jake, you just mm-hmm. launched your Kickstarter or you can approach a company like, as like he did. It wouldn't have happened if he wasn't the artist who developed his skills in creativity. And he's also, he's also a really good graphic designer. He developed those skills and 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 his entrepreneurial creativity that's what's missing from a lot of artists and those artists that aren't willing to to adapt and be creative and think outside the box and not wait for the world to to come to them but they go out there and and do their thing Mm -hmm. they're going to thrive while other people are going yeah i stole my job Mm -hmm. so there's going to be people that are winning and you want to be one of those, those of you. It's, that a, it's a good point. It's a good point. If you're basically saying if, if you're an artist and you can just be replaced because a machine made a pretty image, well, how much of an artist actually were you in the first right. place? Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm signing on with a new agent right now as a, as a lit, she's a literary agent and she's asking for my writing. There is nothing I could enter in an AI software that would be the next step for how I'm working with this person. Mm -hmm. I need to, I need to present a manuscript and, or at least pitches for story ideas and things like that. And so like kind of backing up what Will's saying, there's, there's still a whole big thing aside from the image creation. I think so many artists do get caught up in, Oh, here's the color I used. Here's the, the, the image itself, but it is, it's everything. It's not just the image. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I, you know, I see these people who are um, uh, in in art school right now, and they're like, "This is where you know, this is the field that I'm going into," and they're discouraged because they're like, "What you know, what what will I have to offer to this?" And I think what makes a great artist for the last thousand years, and what's going to make a great artist for the next thousand years, is your life experience translated into images and um some people might use ai to do that some people might not use ai to do that but at the end of the day you're going to be competing with someone who knows how to oil paint but also someone who knows how to put prompts really well into a computer and what are you going to do to give yourself you know to 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 make yourself be able to compete compete in that environment um and it's it's it you you will find, I think you will find if you're like what we're the three of us are saying, you'll find a way to get work and to use your creativity to contribute to society in some way. I think, I think that's possible. I think it's there. Um, one example I could think of is, um, AI I don't see as being like an end to end problem solver for in, let's say in the entertainment industry, we could do even in like illustration, children's book publishing. It's not going to be an end-to-end thing. You're not going to have a children's book author 
typing in their manuscript into AI and getting all the images back that they absolutely were hoping for and expecting, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to, characters aren't going to stay on model. Backgrounds aren't going to, you know, match. So there's still going to need to be somebody with uh, some sort of art ability that happens in the middle there to make sure everything, and I'm saying this is like, if they really want to go the AI route to save money, they're still going to have to hire someone who knows Photoshop or someone who knows something to kind of tie it all t- together and a prep team it to print. And, yeah. You think that's exactly. going to be it? I wonder if that's going to be an official job. Like you're an AI sort of retoucher or something like that, <laughs> where you're the guy that's brought, yeah, you got to just make it into something that's, you know, that, it, that, you know, that on chihuahua the riding side, a monkey. <laughs> right. On the entertainment side, like a production needs to have at the end of the day, something animated to or some sort of visual effect or some sort of actor in an outfit on screen right and so yeah a producer can just plug a bunch of prompts into you know put the whole movie script into mid journey or stable diffusion or whatever these things are and they're going to get back maybe some results that are actually good but then someone's going to have to build it practically you know they're going to have to design the mask that the person's going to wear they're going to have to design the the you know the the space car that they're going to you know get in and fly they're going to you know there's still going to be people who need to translate what these things are making into something actually applicable and usable so i i kind of look at it as like um this opens up more jobs for for people in the future who are creative, but ne- not necessarily crafty, right? Does that make sense? Uh, when I worked at um, Blue Sky Studios, we had th- three to 500 people uh, at the time working on animated films. And there was an art department, and these were the people who knew how to draw with, not even with pencil and paper, but you know, digitally, right? So even there, it like had evolved from 20 years prior to that. But I knew amazing artists who may not had been as good at drawing as the people in the art department, but who could light a scene beautifully. Just they knew the exact way to like place, um, place a light in a scene, what intensity, what color of the light, and 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 how the shadows, you know drape and fall over the figure to like emphasize certain areas like that was an artist using digital tools to create their art could they sit down and paint a portrait probably not but could they light a beautiful scene yes so essentially these digital tools gave a art a job to someone who was an artist who might not have been able to have a job as an artist 50 years ago right so Right now, this is opening up possibilities for people who are creative, who ha- who are artists, but aren't the kind of artists we traditionally think as artists. Mm-hmm. So, should we wrap it up there? Is there anything else we need to say about this? I, what are you, I, what are your guys' uh, if you were making an, an AI program, what would be a name that you'd throw out there? <laughs> While you're thinking of that. I just want to touch going back to the question from from Jennifer because this is all kicked off by by Jennifer. Just going back to the copyright part of it, um, should AI be able to? Should you be able to plug into AI and say, "I want to make uh, a Lee White style illustration," mm. and be able to submit that to their you know to their publishers? Like, here's here's something that I can create. And they're already doing that with the, that was our Brittany Lee example or John mm-hmm. Klassen. Everybody's mm-hmm. already done that anyway. So it's not like the, the AI is changing that or that everybody Jeez. had their own individual right. style. Right. Out of the bag. Right. Yeah. So I guess our stance on that, our flag in the sand is, eh, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> well, let me use a, let me use a better analogy with it, with what people are concerned with, with the copyright. It's the, it's the same argument as if, I had because it's using so many images. Now it is using images in a database as a starting point, right? So mm-hmm. maybe my images as part of that, and you and Will's and Jake's and yours too. Uh, but 
I use the example of if I had a magazine right here, I can't just rip a page out and say, okay, this is my Im image, right? Somebody else made that image. It's just one image, one page. But if I took the whole magazine, ran it through a shredder five different ways, and then it's all just little dots on a piece of paper, and then I compose a portrait out of those little dots of shredded paper, is that a copyright violation at nope. that point? Of course not. not. So nope. it's the same exact thing it's doing. Yeah. yeah. All right, that, that problem solved. And I think we answered the question of whether or not this is a threat. It's a threat for people who aren't creative and it is a tool for people who are creative. And I, uh, that's it in a nutshell. And here's my name for a uh, AI um, program that creates art. I'm gonna call it um, Rando Distribo. <laughs> Rando Distribo. <laughs> Distribo. I'm gonna, go with Distribo. I'm gonna go with kaleidoscopic. Okay, oh, you beat me. Good. That's, that's, that's pretty actually good. actually kaleidoscopic. Kaleido okay. oh, God, now i got to come up with something to beat kaleidoscopic all of a sudden. That's... that's How about... Good. Good. How about... Um, uh, uh, oh, how about this? Mo motif explosion. <laughs> <laughs> or you could go I cute, want, I you could go so, cute with something like mashed potatoes or something. Some kind of cue off the, like, isn't there the particle accelerator kind of thing that takes yeah. data and, or matter and uh, so some kind of accelerator. Accelerator. Art accelerator. Art accelerator. Art accelerator. Accelerator. <laughs> but the, the, there's no ER. It's just R and the R is lowercase, right? Right, right, right. Trademark. Art accelerator. What was the other one we prior to? It was Genesis. Genesis with a three as the E. And, and, and uh, every I is actually a Y. <laughs> right. <laughs> we do have a naming service company that we need to start now, guys. We need yeah. this is our this is our Can springboard. See, being creative. Candy how about Candy Blender? Candy Blender. Dude, I like candy it. Blender. See, AI has taken our illustration jobs, and now we're going to be a naming. <laughs> What's the name studio? of our name generating business? Oh God! Name generator dot LLC. <laughs> <laughs> it's so dumb. Oh All right, boy! Let's wrap it up. We we let's name it. Wrap it up. All right. You you come up with it. We name it. <laughs> we should have. A I should add that we too. <laughs> <laughs> we actually paid a company to, to name our own company, and then that company named it the same thing that we already named it. Right. True they story. Did their, but they did really good. <laughs> they came up with some really good names that we couldn't use for reasons. Correct. That is true. Mm -hmm. So to give them credit, they did a really no, we, good No, we would have used their name if we were starting from scratch. We from essentially scratch, yeah. hired someone to tell us our name is fine the way it is. <laughs> yeah, even though we don't like it. Not three point uh, perspective. Bleep no, that out, Daniel. That's SVS Learn. We like S it. SVS Learn. Which... It happened to me the other day, by the way. Someone was like, SV what? SVC? No, SVS. And I had to finally write it down because they were hard of hearing. Yeah. Oh, geez. sort of. FVF? Yeah. Like Frank? Yeah. Victor like Frank? What? No. SVS? SVS. What's what's the uh, uh, what's the military numbering system? It's uh, it's uh, SOS. What's, no, no, it's like whiskey tango foxtrot. But yeah, what, what oh, the, yeah Alpha yeah, Bravo. Yeah. yeah, what would it be for SVS? Would you guys know? It's like it'd Vector. Be, uh, Sam. Uh, Sam Victor, Vector Sam. Sam. Sam Victor Sam. I think Sam. Yeah, something like that. So maybe that's what we start calling it. <laughs> Sam Victor Sam naming. Company. <laughs> this needs to end. Uh, I know. Let's put this out of its put this out of its memory. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by SVS Learn. That's Sam Victor Span Sam Learn dot com. Where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts today have been Will Terry, and you can find his work at willterry.com dot com. Uh, Lee White, and you can find his work at LeeWhiteIllustration.com. And I'm Jake Parker, and you can find my work at MrJakeParker.com. Podcast is produced by Daniel Tu. That's Daniel T-U, and you can find his work at DanielTu.co. Special thanks to Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott. A thank you to Lily Howell for our show notes and our customer service rep. Uh, is that what we're calling her? Sure. Customer. Yeah. Okay. Annalise. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think that's it. Now go draw something.
so we moved in to this house in Arizona and everything's good. Things are going, uh, one month into it, we get the, uh, the energy bill and it's $800. And, and Allison's, Allison's like, like, nah, this is wrong. <laughs> what? And I was like, what? 800 bucks a month for electricity? Wow. Oh my! What the God. heck? And so she's like, it, something's wrong. <laughs> something's got to be wrong. So she calls up. She's like, I think, I think we were overcharged. Can you just check and see what the, uh, you know, what the history for this house is? And she's, ladies in there doing it, clicking around and. She's like, yeah, 800 that's about right for summer. I it picture was August. Elaine from Seinfeld going, it'd be right. <laughs> it was, uh, she's like, that's about right for August. You know, you guys are running your air conditioner. And we're like, what the heck? That's yeah, just not, we didn't budget out for an $800 a month energy bill. <laughs> um, and so then we came to find out that the air conditioning we were using was 20 years old. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. Was, maybe a little bit older than twenty years old. Uh, it was the original to the house. Wow. And and it was like it was like low on all the performance levels, you know, for 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 what it. So it was just cranking as much as it could to like keep up with the needs of heat and everything. And so that's where that's we are. We, that's when we replaced it. And now, now you're four hundred. Uh, three fifty, three fifty, like that. Yeah, shaved off a good four hundred fifty bucks. Too shabby. Anyway, that's our uh, that's our um, just HVC. mid middle aged banter is what we're doing here. <laughs> How about those taxes? <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking about the sports game. Or I, I will say this before we get started. Um. There's this whole thing going on with Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles and Florence Pugh, who are these uh, Hollywood actors and actresses, right? And there's this movie thing that's happening, right? I could could care couldn't care less. I don't know how, what the how the saying goes. There's no way I could care less than what I care right now about this. Mm-hmm. Yet. Somewhat, I saw a thread on on Twitter that just kind of explained the drama that's happening on set of this movie, and I couldn't stop reading it either. <laughs> give me the give me the it, the, the, the nutshell the, at the Venice Film Festival. That's part of it. That's part of it. The nutshell is this: um, Olivia Wilde is an actress. She's directing. I don't know if it's her first movie she's directing or whatnot, but she hired for the. The two main leads, Florence Pugh and uh, um, Shia LaBeouf, Uh right? Oh, he's always in a mess. (laughs) Right. The guy is trying to clean up his life now. Like he's on a, Mm -hmm. he's uh, he's turning things around. I think he's he's seen how you could really ruin your life, and he's taking steps to like make it better. Right. Okay. So. Florence Pugh says, no, I'm not working with this guy. He makes me uncomfortable. And Olivia Wilde says, no problem. Uh, we'll let him go and we'll replace him with, um, I think, Harry Styles, who she has a relationship with. It See, this is like high school stuff happening now, mm-hmm. right? So uh, Shia LaBeouf is like, what? I'm getting replaced? This is not like... The 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 and this the is playing out being, in social media. Yeah, the reason being oh. he was replaced was because she's super uncomfortable with doing certain scenes with him, and and uh, and he's sort of standing up for himself. He's like, uh, uh-uh, uh, that's this is not how it goes. Um, Olivia Wilde actually wanted me to stay on this show, and she's trying to manage. Miss Flo is what they call Florence Pugh, right? Uh-huh. Um, now, so so now there's these conflicting stories, like who's right, who's wrong. He said, she said. Well, a video was uh, unsurfaced of Olivia Wilde talking to, uh, like, doing a, a video message to, um, to uh, what's his name, uh, Shia LaBeouf, LaBeouf, where she's begging him to stay on the film. And, oh, that's so good. And how she's like pretty much lied to Florence Pugh. So now there's like, so that's out. 
and at the at Cannes, you've got um, you've got her not showing up to certain events and showing up to certain events, but not even making eye contact with the director. Oh no! And so it's just like all this stuff. What a I don't mess. care at all about it, but yet I can't like. Now you care. I can't turn away from it. <laughs> well, that's the train wreck kind of philosophy. You can't help it. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's like it so doesn't matter. It's so unimportant. You know, if you just do the right thing and don't lie, these mm-hmm. things don't happen. Yeah. I mean, and then, and then it just keeps escalating. Like, that's just, like, the core of it. Then there's this video where it looks like Harry Styles spits on Chris um, Pine's <laughs> lap. But and he doesn't? Chris Pine's in the film. And everyone's, it's like, it's called Spitgate. And everyone's what? like, did he spit or did he not spit? spit? They can't tell. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is, is, Chris, is there me. any movie that Chris Pine isn't in right now? He I don't is know. the hot ticket right now. He's pretty it? he's pretty hot ticket. He's pretty hot ticket. I saw a tweet where someone's like, please explain this to me in NFL terms. I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> and it's like somebody okay, drew it out. So the head coach of the Steelers is sleeping with the quarterback. But uh, and he, it, you know, and it's like, and uh, Chris Pine, he's just the tight end. He's nose to the grindstone, just trying to make it yeah, to the season. Just trying to make it to the season. <laughs> uh, it was so funny. Okay, should we start this podcast? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, I was gonna say is, I've heard some of the music that the younger generation listens to. And I know this is old man shouts at cloud type of stuff, but I think AI could really do a better job. (laughs) (laughs) Do you, do you, well, okay. What do you, what do you mean? Go elaborate on that. What do you mean? Well, do you ever hear those songs where it's like, there's just like this, um, you know, ticking noise where it's like a tick, 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 and then there's just a guy who's just like who probably just woke up from an all night bender on whatever. And he's just like, I'm in the middle of it. I'm going to do it. It is a bit. Now everybody come in. And it's like, you know, it's just like, right. I don't even know what kind of music that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is this? I'm sure there's Fancy someone listening. German techno kind of thing. Well, that guy's making a uh, hundred million dollars this year. Yeah, he figured it out. Maybe I need to do my own album. It's crazy. I saw this one uh, TikTok where the guy's like, "You don't need music theory," and he's he has like a, you know, one of those, uh, essentially like Garage Band, but the professional version of it. He's like, "You just pick the instruments you want, and you just." click random notes here and watch i'm gonna hit play and it's all he's like uh yeah maybe you did need theory (laughs) maybe you did need theory (laughs) 